but it's pretty nice. I think it's, it holds a good crowd, as we can see here. It's easier getting the books in than it is at that museum. You know, that was up those steps. I mean, it was tough. But glad to be here tonight. Uh, I've really had a busy winter and spring. I came up with a new program called Christmas in the American Colonies. And that one really hit big from about November 15th on. I had programs. Uh, that's really a popular one. I've in introduced a new Civil War program called Lincoln's Groundwater Navy. It's about the gunboats that went right up and down this Ohio River here and all the way down to Vicksburg. They came up from New Orleans. So that's been a popular program. Uh, I, of course, everything shut down because of COVID. I think I had to cancel over 50 programs. I've gotten them all back, I guess, except seven. And I don't think those will ever come back again. So you just have to turn the page and move on. But I couldn't get out. I couldn't do my programs. Couldn't do the kids' programs. It was terrible. But I did have a novel that I was wanting to write. So I just made lemonade out of lemons. I won't tell you I didn't complain. I mean, I did. <laughs> I cried. I cussed. You know. But uh, anyway, I got, the, got this new book out. And the terrible thing about it is the actual volume. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, don't go to sleep with this one on your chest. But it's actually, but it's about two books in one. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it takes place in Ireland in 1739 and 40. I'm, what I'm doing, I'm dropping back and telling the, the father-in-law story in Witter's Landing. You know, Craig Ridgway's father-in-law. And I have him conceived in Ireland, born on a ship off the coast of Maryland. And then, you know, you've got what it's like to live on a Chesapeake Bay tobacco plantation. You get to see how the Catholics were treated in Ireland under the Georgian Protestant ascendancy, the rules that they did to proscribe and beat down Catholics. They were out to kill their culture. They were out to kill their religion, their way of worshiping. And many of them previously had come over to Maryland, where Maryland, you know, was founded as a haven for Catholics. So that's a really complex story. Mm -hmm. People came over here, but then the government in England changed. And so then people in Maryland, Catholics, were also discriminated against. My main character becomes an indentured servant. And I draw some comparisons to how the Irish Catholics were treated, and he witnesses how the slaves are treated in Maryland. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. And that's one of the rebels abroad. The second Rebels Abroad is a psychopath. Now, they didn't have that term then. Uh, has anyone in here read this book yet? You have. Yes. He is a psychopath. Yes. He's a manipulator. He's a liar. He's a womanizer. He's a cheat. He's a killer. And, of course, how do you define that line between when you're trained to kill in the Army, you know, and then, you know, he enjoys it too much, you know. And he uses the excuse. And he unravels throughout the story. And so as you read it, it's, it's a psychological drama as well as a historical drama. And you keep thinking, how can this guy keep getting away? But you know, a lot of them are psychopaths. Uh, the psychopaths are con artists. You know, they know how to, to tell a lie with just enough truth to have people believe them. And so you watch, of course, they're all <laughs> tied together. This Lord's son and Thomas McDonald, who's the Irish, the, the indentured servant, he's a master craftsman, a carpenter. They're linked by that man's daughter. And of course, well, I told you, Martin McDonald was conceived in Ireland. I'll leave it there. But uh, this is the newest book. I'm not talking about it tonight, though. I, I just did, but, <laughs> but uh, I'm talking tonight about this beautiful geographic feature that we share on both sides of the river. You know, we 
I mean, you've got something over here that we don't. You've got that beautiful view of the promised land of Kentucky. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it really is, it's just phenomenal. When, when people come from other countries, I hosted an English family, and they were just literally gobsmacked at the size of the Ohio River. And, of course, they didn't know that now it's about twice as wide as it originally was because of all the locks and dams. We're going to look at the history tonight of the Ohio River, something that you know something about because you live here. You're going to recognize some photos. But you're also maybe hopefully going to learn a few new details as well. Okay? Settlers from the very beginning realized the vast economic importance of the Ohio River. Because they saw it then, and it is still today, the super highway of America. From the earliest times, a number of different peoples and a varying array of transportation. You're going to see it tonight. You're going to see some uh, different types of craft on the Ohio. And it has, from the beginning, the Ohio has been critical to the American economy, involving many states whose boundaries, rivers and canals, connected with the Ohio River. It's not just that one river, there's a bunch that feed into it, okay? The first craft on the Ohio River was undoubtedly the dugout canoe, made by the early Native Americans. The first Europeans to see the Ohio River Valley may have been a party of 23 Spaniards who were searching they come up the Mississippi and Ohio rivers in search of a lake of silver. Now you've heard of Coronado and the seven cities of Cibola, the cities of gold. There were all these legends that they were trying to find out. But there were also, very close to that same time, we have a Frenchman by the name of René Robert Cavier, Sieur de la Salle, who in 1669 led a French expedition to the Ohio River. So the, the next Europeans were certainly Frenchmen traveling what they called the La Belle Riviere, the beautiful river. Uh, the Ohio linked French settlements in the north, you know, along the Great Lakes in Illinois, with the very European city of New Orleans to the south. So very, very important. A lot of the early crafts that they used were called pirogues. And these were large, you know, boats that could be rowed, and they could even be wrapped to sail, you know, when the wind favored. The next evolution in the Ohio River was the barge. Now, it's not like our barges today. It was a big, rounded boat, larger, some maybe 30, 40 feet long, 12 feet wide, with an enclosed cabin, often with a small uh, cannon on the front, uh, it, again, was propelled by banks of oars. And, it seven, and that, this one was a, ro a row gallop. And sometimes that river bent. You could catch the wind and you could take it, you know, several, maybe a half a mile or two and pull it in and row some more when the wind was against you. We know of two men named Gibson and Lynn who went from Pittsburgh to New Orleans in 1776 to bring back a hundred and 36 ke uh, kegs of gunpowder. That was something we were very short of in the early part of the American Revolution. Okay, they brought it to Pittsburgh. Here's another example of a barge. Now we have a new boat coming on. It's called the keel boat. Now these were long, narrow, cigar-shaped boats. Okay? And they were easier to pull upstream because you could have a team of maybe 12, 14 men, and then you were, had the mud bottom, and you could use those poles and go up river. In fact, they would send a small, maybe a canoe out with a 200 foot length of rope, find a stump or a tree, tie on, and the rope was attached to a crank. You know, it, this was called a cordel. And you could actually do cordelling and wind that in and pull yourself up unhook, make it pull a little, then cast that line out again, 
and wind it in, sort of like a winch, if you will. Okay? <coughs> These are different examples of a keelboat. Okay? Now, the late 1770s and 80s, we have the new, very common boat that appeared on the Ohio River, the flatboat. Okay? Almost every boat was unique. Some builders kind of knocked together a 45 foot by 15 foot open area with a small cabin on it. And it had one purpose, to convey families downstream to their, uh, you know, their homes, their prospective farms. These flat boats were simply constructed, two and a half inch thick frames or planks over a frame of six or eight inch square timbers. timbers. It was a one way boat. It was not coming back. It was too square to go against the current, too large, too heavy to pull. And so it generally was broken up and used as cabins. And in fact, New Orleans, with all the flatboats that went there, New Orleans is built, you know, a lot of the framework for their buildings was built by American flatboats, especially if it was yellow poplar. If you ever see one of these uh, cabins that's still around today, 200, 300 years old, the best bet is that it was yellow poplar. It's anti-mold, anti-rot, anti-insect. And so this is what you wanted to use on these boats if they were going to take you long journeys. And we're going to look at one of those in just a minute. Here's some more. Flat boats hauling from Pittsburgh to Pennsylvania. They moved families, livestock, and possessions to the present-day states of Kentucky, Ohio, and Indiana, and other states. This is a really famous uh, photo, it was, or etching. Uh, it was done by Alfred Wode, and I loved this picture. When I was in high school, I had a very cool history teacher that turned me on to history. I mean, I just fell in love with it. And after we'd done the age of exploration and the colonies and the American Revolution and the Constitution, then we moved in to westward movement. And when I wrote Winter's Landing, that became the cover. It was in the public domain. So you'll see it's on the cover of Winter's Landing. Okay? So there it is. Oh, well, I could have done that. <laughs> Save myself. Okay. Now, records show just in just a few months, you know, we're not talking a year here, that 177 flatboats 2,700 people aboard passed Marietta, Ohio, okay, and they were heading west. By 1818, we have records of store ledgers uh, that, from Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois that provide a partial inventory of what they bought and sold. Uh, you had coffee, tea, sugar, spices. Well, these things didn't come up the river. They came down the river after they'd been hauled from Pennsylvania, you know, uh, down uh, the Ohio. And then if you had stores, if you, had a, if you lived on the Ohio River, you had access to a whole lot more than people living inland. Okay? <coughs> Spices, whiskey, wine, bolts of cloth, thread, sewing items, even ladies' slippers. Tools, nails, and that, you know, again, iron is very rare on the frontier. Several kinds of hardware, fish hooks, bar iron, steel traps, soap, and even citrus fruits made it here to the Ohio River. Now the next boat, and I hope you'll get a chance afterwards to come up and take a look. Don't trip over the cords. I, I say that, and I probably will. But the next boat is called a Broadhorn or a New Orleans boat. Now this was a big flat boat that was covered with a curved roof. It shed rain very well. Usually you had an open doorway with a ramp. And again, you took like your barrels of whiskey and you rolled them up, put them inside, and stored and secured them, and loaded your bales of uh, hemp, your hogsheads of tobacco. Hemp, of course, was very big in making rope. Sometimes you might take a horse because this boat isn't coming back either. It's a one-way boat. Some people made more from their boats than they did the goods that they sold. 
Because if they had yellow poplar for those logs, and people said, I want that, that will sell well in the Caribbean and in the humid subtropical climates of uh, Louisiana. And a lot of Mr. Piggies went down the river. However, they didn't go like this. They were salted and in barrels, you know, mm -hmm. and sold to the population of New Orleans, which was about 10,000 at about the time of the War of 1812. In 1811, this appeared in Winter's Landing. We have the first steamboat on the Ohio River, and it was called the New Orleans. That's where it was destined for. And it was built uh, to basically traverse the river going down and up. Now what it did, it made it all the way to New Orleans. And it ran between New Orleans and Natchez for about a year and a half. And then it broke its larboard wheel, not the starboard, but the larboard, the left. And it tore a hole in the bottom of the boat and it sank. Now I didn't know this until I did the research Steamboats, even some of the real fine looking ones, you know, the floating palaces of later times, the average lifespan was five years. But they were hugely uh, profitable. You could really make money if you owned steamboats. But this steamboat had to wait in New uh, Louisville for uh, the high water because, see, Louisville, that's the only place where the Ohio River was interrupted by the falls of the Ohio. 28 or 26 feet, I think it is, going down a series of rapids over two, almost three miles. And so they had to wait until high water. Now, Nicholas Roosevelt took this journey and he brought his wife with him, and a great big black Labrador dog, you know, or Newfoundland, Newfoundland dog. She was pregnant. And while she was in Louisville, she had that child. And she finished the journey with him. They took a sailing ship back around the United States and up the coast. But that was phenomenal. This was the first steamboat on the Ohio. Then we have the Enterprise that went all the way to New Orleans. It arrived after the battle. It didn't help Andrew Jackson much with guns. He'd already beaten the British. But then it was held there because it was in violation of a monopoly. Well, the Enterprise trial, Judge Dominic Hall presiding, said, oh no, it's a different type of, of machinery. You know, the other boat was a side wheeler. This was a stern wheeler. It was a different craft altogether. So they tried to get it on the patent law and it, it failed. That case failed. And so this Enterprise trial becomes a very instrumental uh, precedent for setting the Supreme Court ruling, McCulloch versus Maryland. Okay? So moving on, uh, oh yes, this ship went all the way to uh, New Orleans, came to Louisville in 1815. Uh, that was 1,500 miles. It had to wait several weeks. And then a big flood came, and they were able to power past the falls and get back to Brownsville on the Monongahela. Overall journey, 2,200 miles. It's sort of like Charles Lindbergh making that first flight. Some people might say, well, I'm not getting on that thing, you know, I don't know if it made it. A lot of people felt that way about steamboats. Well, there was a new builder named Henry Shree that designed boats even better. He said, I don't want this ship to ride in the water. I want it to ride on the water. So he built basically a soap dish, you know. The other two ships had a deep keel that went down like the New Orleans drew 11 feet. Well, the Ohio River, boy, it's going to hang up on, on a lot of places. But these, these soap dishes, they said, well, they can run on wet grass, you know. And so uh, dew-covered grass. But uh, anyway, it was a flat bottom. Uh, the engine was on the main deck, knocked down in the hole. And it was distributed well. So these boats drew anywhere from three to five feet. And that was a lot better. Okay? Now they started having a second deck they built up. And they said, well, let's put passengers on. Let's cook them fine meals. 
and we'll let them stay in rooms, you know, on board the cat, like hotel rooms. And each room, the first steamboat pilots started naming them like the Kentucky room, the Indiana room, the Louisiana room, and those were called state rooms. So if you ever hear the word state room on a ship, that's where that came from, from the old, uh, you know, steamboats on the Ohio River, okay? This is another example, the Paragon and the Caledonia in the early 1820s. Now this was a profitable business. If you were a farmer and you were clearing land, you know, you had an incentive here because steamboats were like insatiable balls. You know, the ball, bale in the Bible, the big God with the mouth and you kept feeding kids and people, you know, into the furnace. Well, these, that's how steamboats were. They were almost just, you know, they, they were, you couldn't satiate the, the need for food or for, for fuel. So what happened, captains might pay as much as $2.50 a cord of wood. So if you were a young teenage lad and you were out there cutting, you could stack these up and then hang a bottle or a colored cloth and the steamboat would see it, and they'd, boop, boop, and they'd pull over, and they'd pay you for that cord of wood. Okay? That was real. Farmers could get clear of their land and get cash. Okay? Then we started having uh, sawmills and grain mills along the uh, river. And, of course, these would, you know, load onto the ships. And we started having coal mines. Now, the New Orleans stopped at Bond Harbor Hills in western Davis County. There was a coal mine there and they loaded up with this newfangled stuff called coal. And they said, you have to watch that stuff. It burns a lot hotter. And you could blow your steam, your, your steam boilers up, you know. So you had to be real careful uh, controlling that because that killed a lot of people on the Ohio River and Mississippi were steamboat boiler explosions. They let the pressure get too high, okay? Now, as I told you, the 981-mile length of the Ohio River flowing westward from Pittsburgh to Cairo, Illinois, the largest tributary in volume to the Mississippi River, it was obstructed at only one place, the falls of the Ohio. You can see it's, it's not just a complete drop-off like Niagara. It, it was a series of, you know, falls. And in this area, the river flows over hard, fossil-rich beds of limestone. And in very, uh, you know, dry periods, you can actually get down there and walk around. They say now you can't remove the fossils. But that's, you know, across the river from Louisville, right below the McAlpine locks and dams. They decided they were going to have to have a canal to go around these falls. And so they ended up with the Louisville and Portland Canal uh, built to circumnavigate the falls between 1825 and 30. It took five years to dig this canal. And before, you had to stop your boat, unload everything, put it in wagons, have it portaged, that's a French term, you know, to shipping port, where then you'd have other flat boats or, or maybe even a steamboat say, we'll take it on, but we'll take it for this money. So, you know, it was really, it was tough. Uh, there's an example, this is a postcard of the Indian Chutes just below Louisville. Uh, unless the river was very high, you had to unload uh, your, your gear and then have, or your goods and have it shipped down. Some skilled flatboat pilots in high water said, we'll navigate those falls if you want to take the chance. And so then you had to look at what goods you had and make that decision. You might say, no, I don't trust it. It looks pretty rough, you know. Even when the, it was flowing over the rocks, you know, the current would cause turbulence and you might hit one, you know, you just didn't know. But that's what the falls look like. And you can see them, there's some today, there uh, below the McAlpine locks and down, right there. And so they built the long discussed Louisville and Portland Canal. That's an aerial view of it. <coughs> The falls are all through here, and here's your canal. You've got locks, and this was huge. You know, you hear so much about the Erie Canal, you know. Well, this was 50 feet wide, almost twice as wide as the Erie Canal. 
And full-size size steamboats could now bypass the falls. And those people that were involved in, you know, dredge and hauling, they, they changed. They had to change with the times. So are we going to have to change with those electronic vehicles? Are we gonna, uh, I don't know. You know, yeah, they're coming. They say some of the uh, uh, new technology, Chevrolet or GM says they're going to be all electric by 2030 or 2035. It's going to be scary, isn't it? You know? uh, but now, here's the thing. I don't think we should be forced into not using gasoline. I mean, did we make people stop riding horses? When we, it had to happen over time. You know? But anyway, these people were dealing with technology then like we are now. Uh, it opened in a very good time, this canal, because the Alabama fever, boy, I mean, people were pouring into Alabama and Mississippi, and the Black Belt cotton plantations hit. You know, that's when, you know, we all knew we could make money. So these steamboats, they doubled from 1821, more than doubled to 1833. You can see the tonnage and revenue just soared. Oh, yeah, you had to pay to use that canal, okay? Other early improvements were implemented on the river. The government realized the government was here to help, you know, support safety, defense, and the economy and trade, like building roads. So this was part of an infrastructure plan. They started paying taxes for steamboat, or they were called snag boats. And they would go and they had winches, you know, and steam-powered winches. And they would come up because a lot of these steamboats were just plywood. And if they ran up on a snag, they just knocked a big gash in it and down it went, killed people, uh, destroyed, you know, any profits. So they said, we got to do something about that. So they would pull in and they would clear out all the snags that they could. And so this was one of our, sort of like what the Army Corps of Engineers